A new revelation broke this week about what caused last year's explosion of Nord Stream gas pipelines in the Baltic Sea. Investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch alleges the U.S. is behind the attacks. Writing in a substack, the White House ordered the strike as part of a covert operation carried out under NATO training exercises last summer. According to Seymour, it was then that the U.S. divers planted the explosives that were remotely detonated three months later, disabling the pipelines. In his substack, Seymour Hirsch writes that a spokesperson for the CIA vehemently denies this claim. So I, I read the Substack uh, post. It was very long. Uh, it's very thorough. It includes a lot of plausible, seemingly plausible uh, of, of basis of facts, um, you know, na names of equipment used. And, he, and he, he, he says this kind of Navy diving uh, group that is headquartered in Panama City, Florida. Uh, he, you know, he walks through the timeline of it, but I, we do have to caution, this is all based on, an, an, again, an anonymous source that he says is familiar with this operation. The source is not named. There are no documents provided. I am, and I am always, I am extremely skeptical and critical always when the sources being relied upon are anonymous. I understand in this case why they would have to be anonymous. These are high security clearance officials, people who you know, could lose their, not only just lose their jobs, but could go to jail if they were caught talking to a journalist about it. So I understand why in this case, there, you know, the, the mainstream media loves to use anonymous journalists for like, you know, why Trump was mean to someone or yeah, like sure. for totally ridiculous reasons. So here it's justified, but you still have to take it with a grain of salt. And I know, I know Seymour Hersh has done Terrific work in the past. It is also work that has, some of his more recent work has come under scrutiny, again, for relying on anonymous sources. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I've said when we talked about the subject before, I think it is, could, is perfectly plausible that the U.S. could have blown up Nord Stream. I think it is in keeping with operations the U.S. has run in the past. Um, I, don't, I, I don't, but I would need to see conclusive evidence to say that that's the most likely thing that occurred. And this, this <laughs> while presenting a very plausible, again, how this would have happened, um, I, 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 would, I, would need, I would need documentation. I want to see documentation, or I want to see an What kind of documentation? An, an email yeah. from a general to a soldier on a submarine that says, please blow up Nord yes. Stream Pipeline tomorrow at 3 p.m. Yes. Uh, GMT. Well, no, it doesn't need to be exactly that specific, but... <laughs> Look... Well, no, you're talking about, you know, wanting to see documentation and not just making... Yeah, but, I mean, to your point, I think that this is one of those instances where you're not going to get documentation. You mm. might get a disclosure, a verbal disclosure, but it's, it's, it's going to be more difficult to be able to ever yeah. prove this. But look... The Occam's razor of this particular incident has always pointed in the direction of U.S. involvement. They had um, U.S. ships doing training exercises in the region at the time of the explosion. There was reporting in this article about how initially it was supposed to be done kind of immediately, and then there was a request to do to explode the pipeline remotely, so it gave the U.S. a little bit more plausible deniability because it looked so obviously inculpatory to have the training exercises happen right where the explosion then subsequently happens. We have video of uh, Biden officials saying that there are ways to prevent um, Germany yeah, from taking Yeah, and that's mentioned in the substack, the Russian officials oil. saying Nord Stream will not happen one way, one way or, or another, another yeah, right? ominous. And then in, in the interests, obviously, who benefits from the pipeline being destroyed, the idea that Russia was going to destroy a pipeline that enabled it to sell its oil to a huge market at a great profit was always sort of absurd. But that was the narrative that so many American uh, politicians and um, journalists were kind of floating in the wake of the explosion. So again, of course, caveat, we don't know actually, we can't conclusively know what happened. But this reporting from a very respected journalist who it's worth noting has been smeared in the context of him writing the story. Um, but the, 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 the this, this story seems to confirm what the most obvious explanation for the Nord Stream pipeline explosion has always been. Whether or not we ever find conclusive evidence of what happened, time will tell. Uh, but the U.S. involvement in international conflict has drawn the ire of many, especially those who contend it's purely motivated by the military-industrial complex. Former Pink Floyd rocker Roger Waters spoke at the United Nations Security Council on behalf of the Kremlin on Wednesday and called for an immediate ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine. Let's take a look. Ceasefire in Ukraine. 
today. That, of course, will only be the starting point, but everything extrapolates from that starting point. Imagine the collective global sigh of relief, the outpouring of joy, the international joining of voices in harmony, singing an anthem to peace. John Lennon pumping the air with his fist from the grave. We've finally been heard in the corridors of power. The bullies in the schoolyard have agreed to stop playing nuclear chicken. We're not all going to die in a nuclear holocaust after all. At least, not today. I mean, we should note that it's very important <laughs> if the U.S. did this. I mean, this is... It, it, the Congress has not declared war on Russia. They've also not declared war on Germany, who who loses out when this pipeline is blown up. Um, uh, I, I absolutely reject that the president can unilaterally order this kind of action without a declaration of war against Russia, um, that this is being kept secret from Congress. That, that was kind of the implication of Seymour Hersh's reporting here, is that this was so secret, even the, I think the usual, the gang of eight or whoever it is, were not even going to be informed about it. Mm. Um, you know, this, this kind of has something to do with the complaint I, I'm having lately about all these documents, not that doc classified documents are being found in people's possession, but that all the documents are classified. Yeah. Because this, and, and that allows a government to operate, operate with this level of secrecy Absolutely. that, that that the the intelligence officials could could conduct a, an act of war uh, between two nations that were again we're not at one is an ally and one we're not at war with, and no one would have to know about it and no one would find out about it. Uh, that's only possible with this incredible lack of transparency. So this is so I, I hope we do get to the bottom of it and find incontroversial evidence one way or the other, and that people are held accountable for it because it is not it is not okay whatsoever for the federal government to conduct itself in this manner without the explicit permission from Congress to engage in war. Yeah, it is Congress's yeah. job to declare war. It's the president's job to carry out that action. Yeah. And we've totally gotten that confused over the last few decades. I, I couldn't agree more. Look, there was this great guest essay in the New York Times yesterday called uh, Russia and Ukraine Have the Incentives to Negotiate, the U.S. Has Other Plans, uh, by Christopher Caldwell. And in it, he talks about the kind, the type of aid that the U.S. is sending to Ukraine and how the fact of it being so um, kind of involving technologies that involve kind of remote, remote control of various mm -hmm. kind of weaponry um, it makes the idea of a proxy war. I mean, he compares it to giving weapons to the Mujahideen. And like he says, in those days, you, you give someone a weapon, you give them a gun, and your hands off. Like there yeah. is more of an argument that you are supporting, but not actually doing the war remotely. These days, the nature of the technology is that you are. You know, you you are responsible when 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 Russian soldiers keep getting killed because of a technology that targets self their cell phone service, and it's Americans who have given Ukrainians the technology that is able to target soldiers based on their cell phone service. It gets closer and closer to these people would not be dying but for American intervention. Mm -hmm. And he go, he he walks through the negotiations over who was going to give tanks, how um, Germany was really pushing back against the idea of providing tanks in particular as equipment to Ukraine, and they eventually acquiesced at, under a lot of pressure from the United States, but how they as a country have been trying and successfully for the last couple of war cycles to stay out of it, despite the, the Americans uh, urging, because they know exactly how poorly these things can end up, and that we're getting closer and closer to not just being a proxy war, but a real full-out uh, conflict with another nuclear power and how there just are not nearly enough alarm bells being rung about that possibility. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we will have more rising right after this. Stay with us.